Allie, do you want to go next? Yeah. And you can introduce yourself and go into your presentation if you like. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my name is Allie Daly, and I'm the Senior Behavioral Health Policy Coordinator at Children's Hospital Colorado. And yeah, I'm here to present today um, on some of the behavioral health legislation that we are watching at the Capitol. There's a whole lot going on. Um, this is only a, a piece of some of the legislation that is moving forward. Um, it would take much longer to present about every everything that's going on, but um, which is exciting. Behavioral health is a huge topic right now with the legislature, um, I think partly due to COVID, but it's also just been in the last few years, a really big topic for, for everyone, which is exciting. It's a, a really good time for people to be um, paying attention to this work since there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, okay, I do have a presentation I will attempt to share. So hopefully it works. <laughs> All right, do you see a presentation and not my notes? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So this slide, I can. Um, I think that Joe will send everything out afterwards um, as far as my slides. So this is my contact information. I'm really always happy to chat with folks um, at any any point about legislation you're hearing about, or if you had questions on something, or if you really want to, if you are curious about how to get more involved. Um, there is always room at the Capitol for people to uh, advocate on different issues, reach out to your legislators on different issues. Um, and so uh, I'm always happy to help people um, kind of facilitate that process if, if I can be helpful. So um, that's my contact information. Definitely feel free to use it at any time. Uh, all right, so we'll just jump in. So um, one of Children's Hospital's biggest goals this year was um, a funding restoration on a bill that passed in 2019, Senate Bill 195. Um, and there were some kind of main components uh, to this bill that Children's Hospital really, when, when they ran the legislation, were really focused on creating a better system for kids um, and in the, a better kind of a system that worked better for behavioral health for kids. And so there was a lot of different um, elements to it. It was a pretty big bill. And then because of COVID, the budget to implement the bill actually got taken away. So um, there was not, there, it was not able to be implemented. And so there was a lot of things that, um, there was a big reason why we wanted to push it this year because there's a lot of really important components to it. And I think in particular, as we're thinking about kids' behavioral health as they're returning to school, um, it, it's, it's even more relevant now. Um, and so we were successful in restoring the funding into the budget this year. Um, so that was kind of our biggest um, behavioral health initiative this year. But um, just to kind of briefly talk about what Senate Bill 195 did, um, so one of the requirements of the bill was for the Department of Human Services to develop um, a list of screening tools to use for kids. And um, part of the funding in the bill is actually to provide the training for primary care providers to learn how to use these developmentally appropriate screening tools. Um, and that training is done through the Department of Public Health and Environment. And so that funding has been restored. So the training will actually be provided. Right now, the list of screening tools is available online, but it's not really being implemented statewide because there's no funding for training. Um, another really, really important piece of this is that Medicaid is required to um, ask the federal government, CMS, to implement a wraparound benefit for kids um, on Medicaid. And so it basically wraparound what wraparound means is uh, using Medicaid dollars for things that are not traditionally medical care. Um, so you could potentially use it to provide kind of a lot more of the social determinants of health and really like that structure. Um, and so things like being able to use Medicaid dollars to help someone with rental assistance or transportation to doctor's appointments or um, utility assistance and different things like that that really help keep help keep families healthy and safe and in their homes um, and really do benefit behavioral health and sort of the bigger picture. Um, and so that um, Medicaid, they'll be asking Medicaid for the ability to implement that benefit for high acuity kids in Colorado. And then finally, there's a pilot program in there to integrate behavioral health funding. Um, since you all work in the behavioral health space and, and are somewhat familiar with it, you probably know um, how many line items there are for behavioral health dollars. I think the state has been talking about 75 line items over across 10 departments or something like that. Um, so there is this also this pilot program for integrated behavioral health funding. Um, so that uh, that we will, will, will all, that will also be sort of moving forward. And that's really well in line with the work of the Behavioral Health Task Force, which um, is where a lot of these other bills that I'll talk about is, are kind of around. 
Um, okay, so there's a couple, uh, there's kind of like two themes of bills. There's sort of some systems bills, and then I'm going to go into some ones that are more focused on prevention. Um, House Bill 1021, this bill uh, requires healthcare, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing to reimburse for behavioral health and substance use disorder services that are provided by peers. And we know that um, peers are really kind of the future of, of the workforce, and they really help um, people get served by folks who look like them and have experiences similar to theirs. Um, so it's, it's an exciting bill to be moving forward. Um, and this helps, basically there's a prohibition right now against directly paying non-licensed providers. So this bill helps um, kind of get around that exception. Um, and it has, it passed out of the house 51 to 12 uh, with what in one, one absent person. Um, so it seems like it's going on a good path. Um, a lot of the bills I'm going to talk about are awaiting appropriations hearings. Um, that's, that is uh, kind of the, the key in general is um, anything that you want to run, you also have to pass it and you have to fund it. Um, and funding is a big issue. There's about $40 million, <coughs> sorry, there's about $40 million um, that the legislature can use sort of for these like legislative projects. Um, the, the larger budget is obviously, there's huge, huge budget, but there's sort of this $40 million pot for kind of um, they call it sort of like the pet projects of the legislators. Um, so this bill is awaiting appropriations. It's gotten an appropriation from the House. Um, and so it'll just similarly need that appropriation from the Senate and then it can move forward. Um, so a lot of bills that I'll talk about are awaiting appropriations. Um, then House Bill 1281, uh, this bill requires the Department of Public Health and Environment to implement the Community Behavioral Health Disaster Preparedness and Response Program. Um, this is actually something that comes out of the federal government. It's operated uh, through FEMA and is basically behavioral health dollars when there's a natural disaster has been how, how it's been typically used. It actually was deployed during COVID and so uh, which is the first time it's been used sort of for a non-natural disaster. And the idea is to, the program sort of supports and formalizes preparedness and response activities conducted by community behavioral health organizations to help them respond in times of crisis. Um, and this bill would give them kind of a solid state funding um, instead of relying on only when it's, only when this program is activated by FEMA. Right now it relies on sort of a FEMA um, funding. So this would actually make it so that um, it, it has funding year round, anytime, uh, and can be activated when Colorado maybe faces a natural disaster or a crisis um, that wouldn't activate something like FEMA. Uh, Senate Bill 137. This bill, I'm just flagging, this bill does a whole heck of a lot. And I, and I don't even want to go into all the details because it does a lot. Um, it's the Behavioral Health Recovery Act. And it's really viewed as um, the, pur the purpose of the bill is to restore funding to a ton of line items uh, in the budget that were cut because of COVID. Um, there's a lot of behavioral health dollars that got um, kind of consolidated or paused. And we know more than ever, people need behavioral health and substance use uh, resources. So this bill just does a lot. Um, it increases funding for different programs. Um, it like it starts some new grant programs, it continues grant programs, um, it appropriates money to the crisis system, it gives money to community behavioral health centers uh, or community mental health centers. So it does, it just does a whole heck of a lot. Um, and it has passed, it passed out of the Senate 26 to seven and is just awaiting a hearing in the house. Um, but I, you know, I think it should pass. So there'll be a lot of programs that will, I think a lot of people will benefit from the restoration of these funding. And then we'll also see future legislation um, probably in the next few months uh, or yeah, the timeline's a little unclear, but uh, basically using the federal coronavirus relief funds um, that will also be, there probably will also be a lot of funds used for behavioral health in that category too. Um, so we'll probably see another sort of behavioral health recovery act kind of omnibus concept um, for all those federal dollars. This this bill is uh, only state funding. Um, there's House Bill 1276. Um, this is a bill which really seeks to decrease uh, the uses of um, opioids for pain management and encourage non-pharmacological treatments. Um, so it requires health plans to provide coverage for things like occupational therapy, chiropractor visits, and acupuncture um, to really motivate 
uh, I think providers to use those resources more and instead of relying on sort of um, opioids as, as a big pain relief. Um, it also makes changes to limit access to benzodiazepines, which we know are found in a lot of folks um, who have, who complete suicide. So um, we are uh, we're watching this bill also uh, because there's sort of from the hospital angle, there's lots of valid reasons to use benzodiazepines, um, including for the management of things like epilepsy and MS and uh, cerebral palsy. Um, but we are working with the sponsors on that because we do think that limiting access and kind of better monitoring access to benzodiazepines is probably really important. Um, House Bill 1085, this bill actually creates um, a system that allows secure transport for folks who are in a behavioral health crisis. So right now we know most people who when they're facing a behavioral health crisis, um, some of them walk into the hospital, but a lot of them are transported by law enforcement or um, potentially sometimes in an ambulance. Um, and that can be costly uh, for the system, for the individual. It's also pretty stigmatizing um, sometimes in those transports and can be um, somewhat traumatic for people who are in crisis. So it's loud, there might be lots of lights. Um, and so this bill would create sort of a separate secure transport option that would not have like the lights and sirens impact. Um, and it would allow healthcare, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing is gonna be designing and implementing a benefit that makes secure transport reimbursable through Medicaid. So that's also an important component to it. Um, we're watching this one and think the implementation will be really important to make sure that people are transported safely. And because they think it is hard to identify when someone is facing a behavioral health crisis and might, it might be somebody who also has, um, like may, might potentially have drugs in their system. So we wanna make sure that they're, that the resources that are available on the transport are, um, yeah, make, make sure that the person is safe and has maybe potentially access to Narcan or things like that. Addison, I think I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think you, you were starting to go down the road of where my question was gonna be. Uh, as far as the implementation piece, um, you know, I, I work with, with some Medicaid members and, and I keep hearing about transportation issues with the current company uh, that's set up for transportation to like physicians offices or medical appointments. Um, I guess one concern I would have is, you know, we have this transportation service that from Medicaid members perspective doesn't work already. So what would we be looking at here that would be different? I guess my question is who would be overseeing the contract and, and the issues that would come up with uh, secure transfer for crisis situations? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so we we really don't we don't actually know who exactly is going to be managing it. So um, the bill basically has um, the that's that anyone could apply to sort of be the contractor for this service. We don't actually know if anyone wants to be the contractor for this service. So potentially this bill could end up not happening, like not really doing anything. Um, but I think if somebody uh, does want to do it, it's going to be managed by um, I think by the health, by healthcare policy and financing, um, I'd have to look up more information. I can't remember the, all the specifics. Um, but yeah, we're that we think implementation is going to be really key. Um, I think that they the concept at a high level is good and we want to respect people and, um, and treat them, you know, not like they're getting transported in handcuffs. Um, but I do think that the implementation is really key. One thing I think that we see and they, and the bill would allow for this. Um, I think one benefit of this would be secure transport when we're transporting people from facilities after they've already been potentially stabilized. So rather than thinking about it from on the front end, I think after that assessment's done and we're transporting them, say, from Children's Hospital to, you know, a crisis stabilization unit or transferring them to a residential facility, um, that transport, I think, will be more impactful actually, and will likely be easier to implement on that side because we're, we already at that point would have done an assessment on someone and they've been stabilized a little bit more. Um, and right now we rely a lot on law enforcement to do some of that transport or ambulances, which is not ideal. Um, so I think I see uh, the bigger benefit maybe being actually after your assessment, but um, but the the bill, the people who are running the bill see it that they really want to be able to implement it on the front end when people are in crisis. But I think the determining the right, per, who, do, who do you deploy? Like if 911 gets called, do you send out this secure transport? How do you know it's not somebody who would also benefit from needing like an actual paramedic to show up? Um, so just kind of making sure it's done safely. But yeah, that's, that's a good question as far as how it actually is going to get monitored. <laughs> 
Uh, thanks, thanks for answering that. And as, as you were talking about, you know, the implementation piece, the way you described it from the ED to a, a lower acuity setting makes a lot of sense. And it reminded me of a, uh, uh, the, the surprise medical hospital bills that, that came up recently. And I think the only service that wasn't covered under that was ambulance bills. So to your point, I think you'd be looking at a lot of cost-saving measures uh, as a result of this. I think it sounds great in theory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> great in theory, which is always the legislature. <laughs> um, and then the last set of systems bill is uh, House Bill 1166. Um, this requires the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing to work with a vendor to provide uh, basically comprehensive care coordination and treatment training for people who work with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and co-occurring behavioral health needs to really help um, kind of broaden the workforce that's qualified to, to deal with those situations because we know right now that, that we are lacking in that workforce. Um, so different service agencies can nominate providers to receive the training um, and and then the state is going to select kind of who gets to do the initial round of training through this bill. And then my guess is it will kind of continue on. They'll have to fund it in future years to train more individuals. Um, and then they're also going to target specifically having trainers come from underserved areas of the state, um, since we know there's definitely gaps kind of throughout the state. Um, the last sort of big systems bill actually is House Bill 1097. This is to establish the Behavioral Health Administration. You all probably know uh, a lot about this bill. It's been, I feel like it's covered a lot in the news. People who work in behavioral health have been talking a lot about it. And the idea is that it really just, it's kind of a really broad level bill. It sets timelines to create a single state agency to lead, promote, and administer the state's behavioral health programs and develop policies around that. Um, there's a lot of conversation about what it's going to look like. We really don't know yet. There's tons of stakeholding um, out there. I've attended, I have one meeting later today. There is dozens of meetings a week, I think, um, kind of forming this structure. But some things that us at Children's Hospital have been really focused on is making sure that there's a children's governance structure within the larger BHA to really make sure that we're meeting the needs of kids and not just treating them like little adults. Um, we also really want meaningful Medicaid integration. Um, if Medicaid does not meaningfully integrate with the BHA, we're going to be losing out on an opportunity to really improve the system for, for mo the majority, almost half of Coloradans. So um, really having making sure that Medicaid is at the table. They've been really good partners so far. So I think that's a good indication. And then we also want this BHA to be an independent cabinet level administration. Right now, the bill is setting up that the BHA will be within the Department of Human Services. Um, and then the Department of Human Services will make a recommendation in the next few years as to whether or not it should stay within their shop or go somewhere else. Um, we are, we would maybe prefer it to be on its own, but at the same time, maybe not. I think there's lots of benefits to being within um, a department and getting to utilize, um, you know, like HR staff and not because we don't want to just build an entire new BHA and spend a ton of money on having, you know, HR teams that have to be built because any state department has a huge kind of bureaucracy. Um, we want those dollars to go to services. So um, we will see how that looks. But what we do want is a BHA administrator, commissioner, person who has the direct line to the governor and doesn't have to go through the CDHS structure to get approval for things like running bills. Um, we really want somebody who's independent and has their own ability to run bills, run budget requests, things like that. Um, and then there's some key prevention legislation. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of talk, like I said, about how to get kids prepared to go back to school. So there's two, two main bills here. House Bill 1068, this requires um, it's for large health plans only. Um, I can't remember exactly the size, um, but they're doing sort of a phased in approach to this. As part of mandatory health insurance coverage, the health plan would be required to cover an annual mental health wellness exam of up to 60 minutes um, performed by a qualified mental health care provider. And um, this is sort of goes in line with like, if you're getting a physical every year that you should be able to have sort of this mental wellness exam. Um, that bill passed its first committee just last week and is awaiting appropriations, um, as many bills are. House Bill 1258 is really focused on getting kids back to school. It creates um, a program within the Office of Behavioral Health that's going to work with a vendor to use a voluntary self-screening app for youth to kind of screen themselves for mental health needs. And then from that app, they'll be able to connect to providers through telehealth for up to three mental health sessions. And this is 
completely insurance neutral. There's like no, there is um, any kid who wants the three appointments in the whole state of Colorado can sign up. Um, you don't have to screen positive even. You just have to, you have to fill out the sort of the survey, but there's no, no one gets screened in or out. It's just up to the kid to decide if that, if they want that treatment. Um, and those three mental health sessions are completely paid for by the state through general fund. And then if kids are needing to get connected to additional services afterwards, that's when insurance will come up and the provider will try to find them a provider that is covered by their insurance. Um, but this is a big, a big one for getting kids back to school in the fall and, and making sure that they're kind of mentally healthy. Um, House Bill 1106. Um, this is a big bill that got a decent amount of attention. Um, there's also a slate of other uh, of other uh, legislation related to firearms, but this one I thought is particularly relevant to um, like things like suicide prevention. It requires gun owners to safely store their firearms to prevent access by unsupervised youth and other unauthorized users. Um, it creates an offense of unlawful storage of a firearm. So it requires... Um, people to store them like in a gun safe or with a gun lock. The bill also requires licensed gun dealers to provide um, at the time of transfer or sale of a firearm to provide a locking device to secure the firearm. Um, we kind of monitored this from sort of the prevention and accidental um, shooting uh, angle, but as well from also from um, the suicide prevention angle as well and had some providers testify and write some op-eds. Um, like I said, there's other firearm legislation that you could also look up. Um, that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, House Bill 1130. This is a bill that was really important to us. It expands this program called the Transition Specialist Program that helps individuals transition from hospitals and other treatment locations back to the community by helping them find housing, um, helping them connect to outpatient behavioral health treatment, helping them with family supportive services. Um, you can, it, they can do training on independent living skills. So there's lots of different resources. This is administered through Rocky Mountain Human Services uh, right now. And the whole idea is really to help people avoid being readmitted to the hospital or incarcerated. Um, and because we know the time kind of right immediately when you leave the hospital is a really vulnerable time for folks. So this program is important and um, this bill expanded the program. And then the last bill is Senate Bill 154. This implements 988 as the three digit number for crisis response services in Colorado. Um, the goal is to have it set up by next summer. So it, it's not activated yet, but um, the federal law is requiring that it will be implemented nationwide by I think next summer. So um, this is this is kind of implementing that legislation that passed at the federal level. Um, and it passed the Senate 35 to zero, which is um, a good sign for its success. And it's awaiting its um, kind of reading in the house. Um, so that that is actually all of the bills that I uh, flagged. Uh, I don't know how much time, I, I wasn't even monitoring my own time very well, um, but I hope folks just felt like they could jump in. But if you have questions, let me know. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. that's great. No, you're Perfect timing. Um, and it's a lot of good information, a lot of good bills that are in the works and, and it's, you know, there's a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I had a question about, we actually just came from a previous meeting with the state health alliances and there was discussion around postvention. Um, so meaning, you know, especially around suicide and um, things that are happening in our community and the response to, um, you know, supportive response around that. And is there postvention included? I know there's 1258, I think was mental health response for youth, but I was just curious about if, if postvention is, is, you know, part of any of those. Yeah. So actually there was one bill, which I didn't touch on because um, because there's just so many, but House Bill 1119, it actually changes the scope of the Office of Suicide Prevention. So that's within the Department of Public Health and Environment. So that office is called the Office of Suicide Prevention, but actually this bill directs them to like formally change their programming to include intervention and postvention services, um, which I do think is really exciting. It's, um, I, I should, I, I almost did talk about that bill, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it, but it really is like looking at more of a comprehensive view because I think right now they've typically been focused more on the prevention side of things and the kind of campaigns and 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 the kind of like, I think that's what we are, my experience with the Office of Suicide Prevention is sort of that's what I've seen kind of like in the news. 
So I think it is exciting that they're doing that. And I do think partly that community disaster response bill, um, one thing that they're looking at is like, could you deploy that in sort of a postvention sense also? Um, so if there was a crisis in a community, you could deploy community mental health, like mental health center providers to go, um, to like go and get deployed to a school to kind of provide postvention services. I think they're thinking that also potentially, depending on how much funding there was and how busy that program was, um, that they could, that could be another way to sort of provide postvention services. Gotcha. Thanks. Sounds like instead of separating, separating out the prevention and, you know, it's like that holistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, kind of doing like a full comprehensive suicide strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Allie? Hey, Ali, it's Addison. I could probably ask you questions all day. Um, I wanted to circle back to your points about the uh, the new BHA. Uh, I really appreciated what you said about making sure that we're being child specific, having child specific focus, um, and the uh, the aspect of making sure that it's an independent entity. Um, you had mentioned Medicaid, Medicaid integration. Um, I was hoping maybe you could speak a little bit more to that, especially as it relates to parity. Uh, I feel like that's one of my major concerns with this new BHA. Is it it's, again, to your point, it, it sounds great in theory, uh, but how is parity going to be involved? It, it seems like, you know, to me, there's going to be little oversight uh, of insurance, uh, especially as it relates to Medicaid. So I was just curious to know your thoughts there. Yeah, um, this is definitely, this is, uh, the, this whole concept of the BHA is sort of like the proof is in the pudding kind of situation. We will see how it goes. Um, I think, so there is language in the bill or in kind of long-term, I think the idea is to have uh, a little of oversight even over like the division of insurance. And so there's this kind of interesting questions about how that's gonna work sort of functionally um, and Medicaid. So one of the, I, it's hard, it's so hard to talk about the BHA because like the process is still so, so up in the air, but one of the tasks that they've really, um, emphasized that we've been working a lot on in these stakeholder meetings emphasizing is um, the importance of this entity being able to hold uh, hold every the whole system accountable like accountability is kind of the big word um, and so I think there's lots of questions about how that works when you have like an, you have the BHA which will be separate from HICPUF and Medicaid um, but in the recommendations that they've been working on so Health Management Associates is making recommendations on how the BHA is going to sort of function. That's the, they're sort of the contracted provider. And they actually are recommending that the BHA set cross-payer standards for things like quality, service delivery, network adequacy, utilization management, and parity. So their recommendation at least um, is that this entity would have a lot of authority, I think, over those entities by setting standards and like, and I think in that setting setting requirements for the raise and setting like all these sorts of like having almost like having dual contracts like where raise would be contracting with the BHA and with HICPUF. Um, I think there's lots of questions on how that's gonna actually work. Um, the recommendation is being made by HMA, but ultimately the executive committee of the behavioral health task force is actually gonna vote on the recommendation. So it's also possible that the executive committee disagrees with that scope. Um, and decides that they don't want the BHA to do that. Um, there's also a lot of fear that the BHA will turn into the Office of Behavioral Health 2.0. Um, and actually one recommendation that HMA is making is that the BHA potentially doesn't actually absorb any programs and it doesn't administer any programs. It sort of would stay this like high level office of like policy and contract management and, and never actually get into the weeds of implementing programs. And HMA's goal with that is to like have this office really have like the full system view and not get stuck in the weeds. Like Office of Behavioral Health's got, job is to administer so many programs. Um, so sort of like consolidate programs within the Office of Behavioral Health, keep the Office of Behavioral Health, and then also have this interesting BHA entity, which is um, which is interesting. Like I did, I did not expect that recommendation. Um, and so I think we'll I think we'll see how much accountability the BHA actually is able to, uh, I guess, like hold people to. Um, that's what everyone's asking for, but I, I don't know. I think people are, people know parity is not, 
one of my providers recently said parody is a is a multifaceted myth. That's what he called it. So I think people feel frustrated about that. <laughs> I, I love to agree with that statement. I'm going to use that. I'm going to keep that one in my pocket. <laughs> yep. We were doing public comments for healthcare policy and financing about parity and how it's working. And that was, and he, he wanted me just to submit that one sentence. <laughs> so <laughs> well, hopefully this, hopefully the BHA will help with some of that. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Other questions? Comments? Anything? Um, Ali, what do you, what bill or bills do you think have, would have taken the most lobbying or stakeholder outreach? Probably the BHA bill, I would say. Um, in part, because that came out of the Behavioral Health Task Force, there was a, a lot of built-in stakeholder process. Um, I think it was an almost unanimous recommendation from the Behavioral Health Task Force to create this BHA. Um, so I'd say that one is probably the most, like any of the like bills related to firearms, that that's like, a, that's always a big, big push. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's been an interesting session. Things have been like, some things have been pretty quiet, which is nice. Um, it feels like a little bit of a, like it, there's so much going on and there's lots of bills, but they're, but people have been really good partners and kind of like coming to the table early on. So it hasn't, it hasn't required as much lobbying at the Capitol, which I'm thankful for. Um, even though I'm vaccinated, I'm very thankful. I have not had to go to the Capitol. Um, yeah, there's, it, it, I would say that the, the BAJ bill probably is the biggest one. I think because in future years, likely what's going to happen is the BHA will be able to run legislation and the BHA's goal in the next you know, decade is to implement all of the recommendations from the behavioral health task force. And I think there's, you know, 150 or something like it's, a, there are so many recommendations. Um, so I think the, we have to have all these meetings every day, every week for months at a time, um, just to make sure that the system is getting, that the BHA is built well, because it's going to have such a responsibility moving forward to implementing everything else. Um, so that definitely is probably the most work. We'll see more BHA bills like next year will be, this year was sort of like setting the timelines in, in statute to say that the legislature needed to um, like that the BHA needs to exist by a certain date and that different departments need to make different recommendations and release different reports about the BHA by certain dates. Like, so they're just, it's really high level. Next year's BHA bill will actually be the bill that creates the office and kind of sets it out in, st in statute. Like how independent is it? Like what's its structure? Where does it live? Um, and what does it do? <laughs> Which will definitely be a fight. I think that's also kind of goes to the piece. Like I said, the executive committee is ultimately getting to, they're gonna be the ones that run the bill basically um, to build the BHA. But if the legislature doesn't like the direction that they are moving it in, ultimately the legislature is the policy making body and could could decide um so if like the executive committee said oh we don't want the bha to to regulate to do anything with parity and the legislature said nope i don't we don't like that idea they could just they could change it so there is there's a lot of moving pieces still for that um and will probably be a big lobbying effort next year as people try to get in, in, influence in different ways yeah for sure it'll be interesting to see how the bha evolves and develops over the next year or so. So definitely eyes on that. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Allie? Um, I, and just to kind of ping in here about um, Aurora Health Alliance, we had our quarterly meeting in April and we had, we've, we're starting to dive a little deeper into the unhoused population and access to health services and what are the resources and programs that are happening in and around Aurora and how are they, um, where are the gaps and the overlaps. And so we are looking to um, have, you know, a follow-up symposium or panel later in, in the year. And so, um, you know, we're keeping an eye on that in terms of behavioral health access for our unhoused folks as well. Yeah, and there's a ton of housing equity bills um, that I didn't even touch on. If you get into the social determinants of health, I could talk for like 12,000 years about all the bills, um, but there are some really good like tenant rights um, bills and 
just a lot of, a lot of things. Um, housing is a huge issue. One of the, the Behavioral Health Recovery Act, that's the omnibus bill that kind of restores a bunch of funding, um, does include specifically some housing assistance dollars in it too. So there is some, some good recognition of how housing impacts behavioral health. Allie, do you have, I, I'm, I used to be more in the advocacy realm and um, I just children's put out a post session summary um, of all of your successes. We do. Okay, um, cool. Is that like July? You, yeah, I think July, so. so normally okay, cool. it's probably normal. Uh, well, if this was a normal year, I would already be done with legislative session. Um, it's the one that just keeps on going. It's just the one that keeps on going for the rest of my life. Um, and then it'll go, and then we're going to have to come back at some point to deal with the federal dollars that come in. I don't know what, I don't know if that will be a special session or if they'll wait till January to do it. Um, but normally the legislature starts in January and runs until about now for 120 days. Um, so normally the report would be coming out soon. I think we're going to be, the rumor I'm hearing is they're aiming for June 11th to, to be done. Um, so we will be probably releasing the report like end of June or so, but yes, we can definitely share cool. it widely with all and of our folks. We'll, we'll be sure to share that probably in our newsletter. Um, well, thanks Allie so much. That's really helpful to see, to get everything boiled down. There's so much going on and we really appreciate your overview of everything. Um, it was great to join you. Yeah. Thank you. Our, um, the next Behavioral health meeting will actually be a combined meeting with our kids interest group. So that will be happening in August. Um, details to come, but that again will be behavioral health interest group and kids interest group combined meeting uh, around those topics. So the details will be forthcoming, but hope to see you in August. And uh, we will let you know more information when we've solidified the details. So if there aren't any other comments, questions, we'll let you all have some time back. And thanks again, Allie, for your presentation.